The first business of order upon being elected, especially if you have a brute majority, is start dismantling the institutions of democracy. And then, you know, you shape it according to your will, an individual's will or a single party's will. It's, it becomes an autocracy. And that's exactly what we are witnessing. It's becoming very autocratic. From the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Honolulu, Hawaii, Welcome to the Security Nexus webinar episode six, Power Play in South Asia. I'm your host, James Minnick, Colonel, United States Army retired and professor at DKI APCSS. We're joined today, January 16th by Professor Sham Takwani to navigate the intricate geopolitical landscape of South Asia, a region of profound significance, particularly in this pivotal election season. South Asia stands at the crucial juncture with, a, with recent or upcoming elections in the Maldives, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and India. <clears throat> As we focus on power play in South Asia over the next hour, we'll embark on a journey through these nations, each brimming with unique political narratives and challenges. With over 70 elections worldwide throughout the year, the significance of six out of eight South Asia countries undergoing the democratic process cannot be overstated. In the archipelago nation of Maldives, Mohamed Moazou's presidential election victory and recent inauguration signals a potential shift in regional alliances and foreign policy. Bhutan's electorate backed the opposition People's Democratic Party in last week's final round of elections, returning Siring Tabge for the second time as prime minister. <clears throat> that election showcased the evolving priorities of its young democracy. Following last week's elections, Bangladesh's political scene remains under the firm grip of Prime Minister Sheikh Hussina. <clears throat> Pakistan's upcoming elections in early February are set against a backdrop of political controversy. In India, the world's largest democracy prepares for a significant electoral exercise in April and May. As we engage in this critical conversation, we wanna recognize and thank our audience for their insightful questions submitted during registration, which we'll address later in this session. Today, we're honored to have with us Professor Sham Takwani from DKI APCSS. Professor Takwani, a distinguished expert in South Asia security, political violence, terrorism, and media boasts an impressive background. Aloha, Sham. It is wonderful to have you as our first guest in 2024 to, uh, to discuss these really important issues. Thank you very much, James. Uh, this is going to be far more exciting than being locked in a meeting. Indeed, it will be. And I just want to say aloha to everybody out there and a happy new year. Uh -huh. Thank you for that. Sean, would you begin today's session by sharing your journey that brought you to being an academic and this recognized expert in South Asian security? Well, oh, wait, wait, wait. okay, so um, it's been a series of accidents. Mm. Really. Uh, let me begin uh, when I was in college. Uh, I went into college uh, to study the sciences and two years later, I figured it was not for me. I was more drawn to the humanities, particularly history, religion, and philosophy. So I quit college after two years and restarted, went to a different university in a place called Shantiniketan, Vishwabharati University, not far from Calcutta, where I did history, religion, philosophy. And at that point in time, it seemed like I had decided what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I wanted to be like one of those medieval monk scholars. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, you know. And uh, my life might have gone that way had I not uh, taken a trekking trip to the northeast of India, Assam particularly. Uh, where, again... Accidentally, I was witness to the creation of an insurgent movement, uh, which dominated the headlines for the next decade or so and still continues to. Uh, I 
again, by a set of circumstances, I happened to be there, uh, saw this insurgent movement beginning, and that was heady stuff. Mm. You know, jungle treks, mm. blindfolded trips, you know, people fighting for a noble, what seemed like a noble cause, and, you know, just hanging out with the Davids taking on a Goliath, that was heady. So when I returned from the trip, I, I had second thoughts about being this monk scholar. Mm. Um, and I thought uh, I needed to be out there or in the field. I like to be an eyewitness. Um, and I couldn't see myself being cloistered, pouring over dusty volumes. This was before the days of the internet. Um, so <clears throat> uh, after I graduated, I, f I gravitated towards journalism. Uh, because, you know, everybody's making the first draft of history as a journalist, so you're, not, you're an eyewitness. Now, within journalism, I realized, again, uh, as a reporter, there was no guarantee you were going to be an eyewitness. Because under tremendous pressures of deadlines, editors expect reporters to pick up the phone and file copy. But uh, photography has no choice. He's got to send the photographer to the field uh, to get those images. So I opted to move into photojournalism because that guaranteed that I would witness, I would be in the middle of all that was happening around me. And so that's what I did. Um, and, uh, and as a photojournalist, again, a set of circumstances, uh, it was like an echo of what happened when I went to the Northeast, a set of circumstances led me to Sri Lanka to cover the conflict. Uh, when it erupted in 1983, July. Uh, and before long, uh, uh, I'd met all the existing groups that were fighting the war. And it was the Tamil Tigers, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, as they were then called the LTT. Um, I struck up a relationship and I spent quite a chunk of my time as a photojournalist covering the war. That was probably the highlight then. Uh, in the company of the tigers as an embed before the word became popular. Right. Uh, but this time it was not with the, uh, with the good guys, but it was with the enemy, if you want to call it that. Uh, and that was, um, I think, initially, uh, it was all about the adventure, the adrenaline, and the excitement mm -hmm. of doing those things, of finding yourself in sticky situations. But... Uh, that phase passed pretty fast because then you became aware. Oh, and I think that was an important learning ground for me to become politically aware and understand the not just the local dynamics, but even the larger context, regional and then geopolitical. And I think that's what fed my interest. Uh, so I spent uh, almost a decade and a half doing that. And then came a time when I had to take a step back from what I was doing. Um, and I figured uh, that uh, I would go back to school uh, and study what? Uh, I was not sure, but anyway, and it was at that time when new technologies were emerging. The internet was a big thing. Mm. Uh, until that point in time, I mean, the only thing that came to mind when somebody said the word web was spiders. <laughs> And, but the internet was emerging. And so I enrolled in, a, at, in the university and spent two years learning digital technologies, a multimedia production. Um, so my thesis show was a multimedia production uh, based on uh, my experiences in the Sri Lankan conflict. Essentially, I was using material which the mainstream media would not carry for a, hundred, a number of reasons why they wouldn't carry. And so it was a mix of the personal and reportage, which never made it to the press. So based on that presentation, I was offered an opportunity to teach at a university and set up their multimedia department, which I did for a year. And this was in the United States. And then again, uh, again a set of circumstances took me back to India uh, for a brief while uh, to be with you know, personal reasons. And then I landed up at uh, the university in Singapore, mm. where I spent 10 years uh, teaching, um, among other things, international relations and photojournalism. 
Um, so when I figured that this was going to be my new life as an academic, I thought I should get to the business of being an academic seriously, which basically meant publishing and writing. So I wrote my first paper, uh, which uh, was seen by somebody here at the center. And this was uh, in the aftermath of 9-11. Uh, so based on that paper, I was invited to come and give a talk here, which I did happily. And uh, that led to a few more uh, engagements here in the courses that were being run. And it wasn't before long I was offered an opportunity to come and work here. So that was another ac happy accident. Uh, I accepted it and uh, I've stayed to it. I, I mean, I've not uh, moved from here for a long time. You and I have been colleagues since I've been here for seven, going on eight years. Yep. And uh, counted a uh, fortunate uh, blessing to, uh, to, have, to be together. And so thank you for sharing that with us. As we start our discussion, I'd like to invite you to provide an overview of the current dynamics in this subregion. Can you shed light on the key developments and the issues that are shaping the current landscape? And this will help you know, us gain a comprehensive understanding of what's happening here in the region. Right, uh, I think uh, I like referring to the region uh, in an acronym. And after coming here, you learn to think in acronyms. And for me, the acronym I like to use when talking about South Asia is IDEAL. Um, I stands for interconnected. The region is interconnected. Uh, you have five countries on the mainland sharing a border. Bhutan, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, uh, Pakistan. Then a small body of water separates two islands, the Southern Indian Ocean, Sri Lanka, Maldives. And then you have Afghanistan up there, which borders uh, Pakistan. So it's interconnected. Uh, and uh, now you have what is potentially the ninth South Asian state, which is China, which shares borders with four or five countries up there. Uh, and it's making its presence, it has made its presence felt and continues to do so. And that's another factor in the dynamics of the, of the sub-region. So it is interconnected. Um, the second aspect, the word D for ideal, it is also divided and disconnected. Yeah. Now the divisions are internal and external. If you look at, uh, and part of it is the legacy of uh, colonialism, British colonialism. Uh, the maps were redrawn hastily, the partition of the subcontinent. So the India-Pakistan issue uh, revolves around a state called Kashmir, which is a major bone of contention. But within the countries, uh, you still have issues of ethnic um, discrimination. So there are ethnic movements. Pakistan, for instance, has a big problem in Balochistan. It's, uh, it's been a low-level insurgency for a long time, but it's crop, cropping up now. And then especially now with China's Belt and Road Initiative uh, coming under uh, attack in the province of Balochistan. That's one. In India, uh, you have problems in the northeastern province of Manipur. The northeast has often been a problem area in terms of insurgencies and ethnic secessionism. Uh, there have been treaties and accords over the years, but uh, the issue, I would say, has not totally gone away. Uh, and as we can see what's happening in Manipur right today. Uh, it's up in arms. Uh, there's pretty much violence, again, between two ethnic groups. India also had the problem in Punjab, the Khalistan movement, uh, which was militarily squashed. Uh, but it's resurfaced now with India's um, issue with both the United States and Canada over attempts to assassinate uh, Khalistani supporters in both these countries. And that's not gone away. Um, Sri Lanka had this problem with the Tamil movement, the ethnic movement. Uh, again, the Tamil Tigers, the movement was militarily defeated in 2009. Uh, but the issue has not gone away because the Tamil ethnic community still feels, not feels, I mean, it is common knowledge. The issues, the central issues have not been addressed yet. And just because they have been militarily defeated doesn't mean the problem has gone away. 
Uh, likewise, within India, you have the movement called the Naxalites, a left-wing extremist movement, uh, basically comprising the poor, the dispossessed, the uh, landless, uh, and, and again, coming from lower castes. So that's another movement that's not gone away. It's been going on for over six decades. So these are some of the internal divisions that continue. And if you look at um, uh, what's happening in India right now, especially in the last 10 years, it seems like it's a society which is perpetually at war uh, within and without. Uh, and uh, uh, so I wanted to emphasize uh, the fact that uh, it's, it's divided, uh, it's disconnected because of these, some of these divisions. Uh, Ken, classic example, if you look at the intra-regional trade within the South Asian region, it's barely 5%. And this has hugely got to do with lack of trust, lack of political will, uh, high costs of logistics, mm. infrastructure, or, or institutions are not really ready to take on that role to integrate it. If you look at East Asia and the Pacific. Intra-regional trade is 50%. If you look at sub-Saharan Africa, it's over 22%. So in that sense, South Asia is hugely divided, disconnected. The third alphabet is E, emerging. Now, since 1991, when uh, India's economy opened up, uh, you know, it was a life-saving uh, uh, requirement. You had to open up the economy. It was a closed economy until then. Uh, from, since 1991, uh, once India's economy opened up, it will open up the world, uh, and everybody saw opportunities there. We've been hearing about not just India. I mean, and by default, it becomes the region, India being the largest. So when we speak India, I'm not all the time saying India. It means, also means the region. Uh, everybody is talking about, okay, here's a powerful region. It's emerging. It's going to be a global player and influencer. And then in 1998, uh, there was luster added to that when both India and Pakistan tested the nuclear might That's right. in 1998. And by 2000, uh, you, India's um, software industry became known, uh, the Y2K virus and all that stuff. So but by 2000, by the turn of the century, you had President Clinton going down there and saying, India, therefore, by default, South Asia is the emergent power. And then in between, we heard voices from several US presidents. India is not emerging, it has emerged. Uh, the truth of the matter is we're still waiting for the region to emerge. It seems to be the E could be eternally emerging. <laughs> it's, it's not just not happening. Uh, then I'll come to A. A is autocracy. Uh, we just spoke about elections. We'll speak more. We'll speak more about elections in the subcontinent, on the subcontinent. India touts itself as the largest democracy in the world. The point is, uh, I think they view democracy somewhat differently. Uh, they view democracy as electocracy, as just having elections come to power. And the tendency to look around uh, the region, across, maybe the noble exception, or maybe the royal exception is Bhutan at this point, still untainted. But if you look at the other countries, uh, the first business of order upon being elected, especially if you have a brute majority, is start dismantling the institutions of democracy. And then you, know, you shape it according to your will, an individual's will or a single party's will. It's, it becomes an autocracy. And that's exactly what we are witnessing. It's becoming very autocratic democracy, as lip service, uh, they, some of them have been referring to it as electoral autocracies, which could well be the right term for it. So that's the auto. And L, the last word for ideal, uh, it's lurching. It's been unsteady, the progress. If you look at it, even the last 30 odd years. Uh, and and I, would, I, I would add uh, part of the reason and I think it may come up in our conversation as we go along, is um, the largest country in the region, uh, being India. Uh, I think it's had uh, issues uh, with the neighbors. Uh, and you know, if you're not going to carry your neighbors or with you, 
you don't have buy-in, uh, it's going to impede your progress. Yes. But I think bottom line for me is in most cases, in most of the countries in the region, if they haven't emerged yet, um, it's uh, it's not because there are external factors impeding it. Yes, okay, the COVID pandemic was sure. an exception. The really? Ukraine crisis, another exception. And they've come back to back. But primarily, they're dysfunctional. It's, there's always a crisis of governance. And I think most of these countries are shooting themselves in the foot uh, and impeding their own progress. And so that's why... That's how I like to define it as ideal South Asia. But I want to add two more factors. Mm. I mentioned China's presence, yeah. which, which exacerbates certain situations uh, and creates uh, new dynamics. Um, the sub-region has often been, you know, stood up as an example of, well, it's got a huge huge youth bulge, and this could be a demographic dividend. And so a lot of hope has been uh, placed on the youth bulge and, and the so-called demographic dividend. But is that paying off? I think if you look at it, the issue I want to highlight is an unemployment mm. right now facing the region. It's huge. Take uh, I'll give you a few examples. Bhutan. It's it's still recovering from the double whammy yeah. COVID epidemic, and so you've had uh, you've had sixty thousand people, youth, in including government servants, eight hundred of who resigned, and migrating primarily to Australia, uh, Singapore, places like that, Nepal. Guess where a number of them are applying for jobs to fight in the services in Russia. Russia. So you've had issues there, uh, people going there, getting killed, and that kind of thing. The numbers not, might not be phenomenally high, but it just stresses the fact that the un unemployment issue is a yeah. big issue. I think it's going to become a very big issue in the next uh, few years. Uh, India, for instance, a couple of provinces actually advertised, state governments have advertised jobs in Israel. So you go there and do the services which the previously the Gazans used to do, now the Indians could do. So if if there wasn't that level of unemployment, people India wouldn't be sending people out to Israel and cover uh, you know cover or find ways to find them in, uh, employment. So I think unemployment is a, a big issue. The second one is the movement of uh, displaced people, um, Afghan refugees about 1.7 million in Pakistan. Uh, right now, what's happening in Myanmar, apart from the Rohingyas going to Bangladesh, uh, you also have the Chin uh, ethnic group going to a northeastern province of India in Mizoram. Uh, then you had Tamil refugees from Sri Lanka come to India. So I, I think uh, this is also going to play out. And then don't forget, there's this issue of climate you're going to have climate refugees coming up and you're going to see a large scale displacement internally and within the country, within the region uh, that could probably add another layer uh, of uh, issues that these countries will have to uh, grapple with. Sean, that was a tremendously insightful overview. As we consider the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report of 2023 recently came out which evaluates economic participation, educational attainment, health and survival, and political empowerment. It's notable that South Asia ranks as the second lowest scoring region globally, particularly concerning our Pakistan and Afghanistan, which are positioned at the bottom of both the regional and the global rankings. So this situation prompts critical questions. What is being done and what more can be done to tackle South Asia's significant gender disparities and bolster the safety and the rights of women across the region? Well, uh, I think the report, yeah, it had eight regions and South Asia came seventh in That's terms right. of uh, the way the region treats its women. Right. And it's not surprising Afghanistan is right there at the bottom. 
uh, uh, Pakistan, yes. Uh, um, well, there have been countries there which have taken, which which always had a very uh, good, um, I would say, gender uh, ratio and gender balance in terms of parity. Sri Lanka was one, has always been one. Mm. Um, but I think the, I think what one really needs to look at is what's happening in the largest country in the region, which is India. Uh, and I'm going to look at India closely and again, the other countries uh, in the region. Um, almost all these countries, they have legislation, they have policy reforms in trying to uh, you know, dispel these disparities uh, between male and female. Uh, there are legislations. There is the there, there's an effort to. I mean, let me put it this way: uh, there's a lot of lip service paid to it. Uh, there's a lot of pieces of paper which say this is how it should be. This is how women should be treated. But when it comes to implementation and enforcement, uh, that betrays uh, the seriousness or lack thereof in most of these countries, as far as women go. I think as far as policies and legislations go, I think most of them have it and they seem to know what needs to be done. Uh, but I, I think there are two, two, two factors which will continue to plague this issue. Uh, number one is a lack of political will in almost all the countries, too many vested interests. But the second one and the real hard one is societal attitudes. Uh, they're not going to change. You know what? They can change if the governments in these countries demonstrate political will. If they demonstrate political will, a lot can change. So in terms of programs, uh, access to education, health care for women, all that's there in the writing. Yes. Almost all of them have plans. But it's the lack of political will. And it's easy to say societal attitudes. Sure, it takes generations, but somebody has to start it. And there are civic groups, there are women's group, groups who, who add their drop of water in this ocean. But ultimately, it is part of, the, it is part of governance. And unless there is political will, uh, societal attitudes are not going to change uh, as fast, if at all. I mean, forget the speed, but even efforts to change attitudes will not occur unless there's political will. I agree wholeheartedly. I have often thought and held the stance that with regards to gender disparity and, and yes, legislation and, and policy are needed, but it's not enough. No. These are issues, as you said, of political will, political leadership, almost always it's leadership, yep. and culture. And as you said, but I'll say it differently. This is not a time problem. This is not something that with more time, it will resolve itself. It must be the former uh, to, to get us here. Thank you for those insights. Can, can I just add Please one do. more thing? Yes. Uh, again, uh, I just wanted to bring this to the attention of uh, people who are listening to this. I mean, it's again the women who were leading some very critical movements. Uh, if you look at Balochistan, uh, uh, women undertook a 1,000 mile march from Balochistan to Islamabad. And for what? Because they have to keep in focus, because they have to highlight the issue of missing persons or what is called enforced disappearance. Sri Lanka, another case in point, missing persons in the, during the war, enforced disappearances, women on the forefront. Take Manipur in the Northeast of India, women on the forefront. And I'm just giving you two, three examples which uh, which cropped up in the news very recently. But if you really want to look at more examples, I can give you more if there was time to do so. Oh. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing those insights, though. In our opening, we discussed the wave of recent and upcoming on general elections in uh, South Asia. Uh, so shifting our focus to the Maldives, uh, the outcome of the recent presidential election appears to be making a, to mark a pivotal change in the nation's uh, foreign relations, as highlighted by President uh, Moizu's recent state visit to China and his uh, uh, meeting with President Xi Jinping. 
This development suggests a potential realignment uh, in the region's uh, uh, diplomatic landscape. So could you shed light on how this significantly shifts, this significant shift in Maldives foreign policy that might influence its internal development and, and redefine its strategic roles in the broader context of South Asia region? So please, over to you. Yeah, first off, uh... Yeah, uh, President Moise returned uh, after signing 20 agreements yep. with, uh, with China. Uh, more money, more infrastructure, more tourists. Mm. Uh, given the recent boycott by India, uh, they got into a spat, uh, India and the Maldives. Uh, so uh, I, 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 first of all, I need to point out that uh, now uh, this is not the first time in the Maldives that we have a leadership. Uh, which is realigning um, uh, India being the largest neighbor, India being the closest uh, trade partner and uh, first responder during the tsunami. And uh, India was there when there was an attempted coup way back in 1988 by a Tamil organization from Sri Lanka. So all that, there's history, there's a relationship. Uh, however, uh, Maldives, like the other countries, neighbors of India, uh, have had issues with India's attitude and uh, at least overbearing, uh, let's say, behavior. And uh, so all these years, uh, they had to deal with it, you know, take it or lump it. That was an issue until China came. Mm. Uh, so with China's presence, uh, countries have an option. Now, I, I just want to spell out one thing. Uh, it, 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 you know, um, just because these we can call them small countries because of their size, uh, just because they're small, and I want to echo what President Moizu said when he got back from China, we're not anybody's backyard. Just because we're small doesn't give you license to bully us. Sri Lanka feels that way. That's right. Maldives feels that way. Or Nepal feels that way, and so on. So you can call them what you want, small, mid-sized, but all of them, they, everybody has pride in their own nationality, right. whatever it is. So point being, this realignment, yes, it means changing course. Until a few months ago, uh, the administration was seen as pro-India. This administration is seen as pro-China. Uh, and um, these shifts are going to, and these shifts you'll find are not, uncommon in the region or with the pro-China administration, pro-India administration. Uh, I think the biggest thing is um, uh, ultimately, ultimately both India and Maldives cannot do without each other. For India, Maldives is important because it forms a periphery of its, um, its Indian Ocean region um, security. And uh, uh, for the Maldives, uh, though he came back and said, uh, we're no more going to rely on India to send us food, for example, as it has been in, in almost everything. We are going to import food from Turkey. Mm. Uh, we're no more going to rely on healthcare services from India. Uh, we're going to send our folks to, you know, they can go to Thailand, they can go to Dubai, and so on. So point being, you know, India, we've had enough of you. We can manage uh, the reality is, uh, in practical terms, it, it, it's not going to work out. It's going to be far more expensive importing food from Turkey, and not everybody can afford to go for healthcare services to Dubai or Singapore and so on and so forth. So the realignment, it's a, it's a, it's a political move, uh, and it's rooted uh, to a fair degree in uh, distaste and uh, disapproval of uh, being mistreated, if you want to use that word, uh, and I and I frankly, uh, I don't see that as being, as being a very permanent uh, kind of thing. Yes, yeah. it's everybody's going to rearrange their uh, their calendar on how to deal with uh, this particular issue. We want to make sure that it doesn't go over too much over that side. So there will be, I mean, a, a situation like this, uh, you know, mechanics. Mechanisms of self-preservation kick in, uh, and I so therefore there will be. I mean, this realignment. Uh, I think uh, even if it's permanent, it's not going to be that drastic. I, I think uh, 
uh, one shouldn't really uh, press the panic button and start saying, oh no, uh, it's all China again. So I, I would say, um, I'd say right now, uh, there is um, a lot of anger in the Maldives. Um, and India, of course, went overboard uh, with its trolls and all that stuff. Uh, I think once you know tempers cool down, level heads, uh, level headed people will probably uh, make sure that this realignment does not really derail the region. As always, geography matters, and uh, India is their closest neighbor yep. and their largest economic partner, and those things Absolutely. are going to continue. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Let's turn our attention to Bangladesh. So. Under Prime Minister uh, Sheikh uh, Hussein, uh, under a prolonged leadership, Bangladesh has experienced uh, both economic growth and criticism over its democratic practices. So with a backdrop of politically charged uh, environment and the allegations of opposition uh, suppression, uh, how do these factors shape the country's democratic health and its regional influence in South Asia? Well, I'll go back to what I said earlier. Uh, let's not pretend there's democracy in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, and that includes Bangladesh. Uh, this is her fifth stint mm -hmm. as yes. prime minister, fourth consecutively. Um, and granted, under her watch, uh, the country has benefited enormously economically. I mean, don't forget, Bangladesh was written off as a basket case way back in 1971. It was the poorest nation. And today it's doing far better yes, than it all, including India. It's it doing is. better than India is uh, or economically. Now, however, um, the, the pandemic and the Ukraine war has had an effect. The garment industry uh, was up in arms recently, and that's 85% of the country's export. $47 billion mm. comes from garments. 4 million people working in that industry. Uh, that was up in arms uh, primarily because of pay, uh, hikes, and so on. Uh, so all that, uh, and then Bangladesh was very recently taken off the lower, uh, least developing country into, the, joined the club <clears throat> with China and India as uh, developing countries. So the onus, the economic onus has increased. So uh, I think the real issue, what we got to watch out for, I'm not looking at democracy uh, in any of these countries. Uh, most of it is dismantling. It's people fear that Bangladesh is going to become a one party state. I think that's an excessive fear. There'll be a course correction. It can't be what, okay. uh, one party state forever. And remember, I mean, parties like uh, Awami League or or, or when if parties which are identified with one leader, uh, they generally don't last beyond the leadership. That's right. Well, that's a good point. And so uh, it, it's just not going to be a one-party state. I mean, I would find that hard to imagine it's going to be a one-party state. Uh, they have the dominant now, just as the BJP in India is. Uh, and, and don't forget what happened in Sri Lanka. Uh, so, yes, once the individual score, then things can change. But the, the real issue here in uh, Bangladesh is uh, we got to wait and watch to see how she's able to um, overcome, uh, at least recover uh, from uh, the economic crisis yes. that's looming now. And that's going to loom larger, number one. And number two, it'll be interesting to see uh, if there are going to be, if once there is... Um, if she's not able to handle the economic situation well, uh, then the usual thing as it happens in South Asia, protests, violence, street marches, uh, we'll have to see what direction that takes, I think. Um, uh, and that will have its impact too. I mean, the, the trend in all these countries has, to be, has been suppressed voices of dissent that includes the media. And they seem to be getting away with it, uh, but there comes a breaking, an inflection point, and we want to watch, wait and watch and see how she deals with the economy. And if it were to spin out of control, uh, what next is the real question. Um, as far as the health of democracy goes, it's very, very unhealthy across the region. Thank you. 
we're we've got 20 minutes left in our session, so we'll kind of move a little quicker. We're going to talk. We're going to move to Bhutan. Uh, with Bhutan at a uh, at a crucial juncture after its recent uh, national elections and facing challenges such as economic stagnation, but also its youth drain brain. You spoke a little bit earlier. Now, uh, the geopolitical dimension, I mean, that just adds another layer to the complexity, right? And so India's apprehension uh, about China's increasing overtures uh, toward Bhutan for normalized relations and resolution of its border uh, disputes seems significant. So here's the question. In this context, how might a new government in Timpu uh, navigate the diplomatic relations while, uh, with regional powers while addressing the internal challenges of economic growth and youth uh, migration. So foreign and, and, and internal. Yeah. Yes. So India's concern will always remain. Uh, it, uh, I guess it's, I won't call it a knee-jerk reaction, but almost there. Uh, Bhutan, as a sovereign nation, is entitled to whatever it wants, I mean, whichever way it wants to go. Right. But given the fact that India and Bhutan's, probably Bhutan has probably been the, only steadiest friend India has had in the region. It's had its ups and downs with Bangladesh in the past, but right now, great relations with Bangladesh. But Bhutan has probably been the only power, mm -hmm. only country. And um, so, uh, and Bhutan was very clear uh, in that keeping the Indians in the know what its dealings were with the Chinese in terms of resolving border issues, Doklam, and all that. In terms of addressing and I think Bhutan, in terms of navigating India and China, I think uh, it's it's it seems to be doing a good job. It's uh, it's it's very sensitive to India's concerns. Uh, at the same time, uh, it would appreciate if India was sensitive to its sovereign rights mm -hmm. and so on. So that dynamic will continue to play. Um, and uh, as in terms of internal, so he just announced. Uh, the king just announced barely a month ago uh, this grand uh, uh, special administrative region, a city that he's going to develop. It's called Gelefu. It's on the border of one of India's northeastern states, Assam. And 1,000 square kilometers. It's bigger than Singapore. And so it's going to have uh, you know, no pollution companies. Mm. It's going to have uh, all that kind of thing. Uh, basically, to ensure that they're able to sustain the environment in Bhutan. And essentially, Bhutan sees that as an economic corridor between South and Southeast Asia, for Bhutan also to be able to be able to do business with countries in Southeast Asia, that's Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, mm -hmm. Laos. So, and that, <clears throat> and that, of course, once that develops, as it develops, it's going to generate employment for the youth. And not just in the business of construction, but all the businesses that are going to come in the special uh, um, zone. Um, so um, I don't know if I've answered your, both your questions. Yeah, no, I, I asked about internal and uh, external and the youth biology. You spoke about education or uh, employment. So I think that uh, that is good. Let us, with that, then I want to uh, move us to uh, Pakistan. Um, considering the historical perspectives that were provided in uh, uh, Srinath uh, Rahavan's uh, his recent book uh, a few years ago, The Most Dangerous Place, uh, he illustrates the complex uh, interplay between U.S. foreign uh, policy and South Asian policy, particularly, you know, Pakistan uh, is prominent in that book. Um, so, I think we can better understand the current dynamics of Pakistan's political scene through that lens. And so the, so the military's entrenched role in Pakistan often is influenced by external geopolitical factors. And so this then perhaps raises some critical questions. How does this enduring military influence shape Pakistan's democratic processes and civil military relations? What are its implications for the country's long-term political stability? Well, talk of political stability, the military has always stepped in. I mean, there have been military coups in the past, military rule. The military always steps in when they think political stability is in danger. And uh, clearly, the military sees uh, 
the politicians as being incapable of ensuring stability. Um, I mean, the pointer to in that direction would be the fact that there's not been a single prime minister of Pakistan who has lasted his entire term of five years. Nobody, yeah. not a single yeah. prime minister. So clearly the military sees them. The militaries are the final arbiters of Pakistan's destiny. The politicians are, I'm sorry to use this word, but to a good extent, they become puppets. Uh, they become puppets. Uh, and the moment they decide to strike a path on their own, uh, you can be sure they're not going to last five years. Uh, so that continues. And again, all this is in the name of stability. Right. Uh, and there's uh, probably some truth to that because uh, misgovernance is the bane. Uh, corruption is a big issue. Yes. It's still a feudal society and all that, which is not to say that uh, Pakistanis, by and large, uh, are accepting or uh, or, or accepting of this model, if you want to call it the hybrid model, <clears throat> uh, which is not to say it's something that goes down well with the average Pakistani. But everybody understands, even those who are military skeptic, that uh, politicians are just not delivering. And uh, uh, Pakistan has experimented with, experimented with democracy, continues to experiment with democracy in the hope that one day there's going to be a party or a prime minister who's going to stay the course. Uh, at the moment, uh, again, it's a catch-22 situation. Yeah. The moment they want to stay the course, they feel that they need to kind of loosen the military stranglehold. And the moment that happens, I guess the military feels insecure, and then they clamp down, and then boom, you, then you have a situation like we have right now. The most popular prime minister, I think, in recent years in Pakistan, Imran Khan, former cricketer, who's in jail now, his party has been delegitimized, his yeah. party symbol has been taken away, which means it's pretty much like what everybody accuses Bangladesh of doing. It was a, uh, it was a no brainer who's going to win because the other part, the opposition parties were out of the game. Out of game. And the same thing we're witnessing right now, uh, a former prime minister who fell in the bad, got in the bad books of the military is now back and he's their preferred um, um, prime minister in the next elections, if the elections are held on the 8th of February. So I think uh, Pakistan's experimental democracy will continue and probably ad nauseum until, until a point where the military feels fully confident um, and, and don't feel threatened uh, by a course that a prime minister might want to chart on his or her own, assuming the prime minister is not corrupt anymore. Mm. Well, this has been wonderful. Now we've got two countries and we've got 10 minutes. Okay, I'll keep it short. Sri Lanka grapples with a with severe economic crisis, right? Political instability and escalating major power rivalries uh, in the Indian Ocean, in India Ocean region. So are there lessons that uh, the small South Asian nations might draw from Sri Lanka's experience uh, in managing economic policies, political governance, and international relations? What do you think? Uh, yes, um, I think uh, I think I need to get one thing clear. Okay. Uh, everybody blames Sri Lanka's crisis on China's debts. I don't. Everybody says it's <laughs> debt but, trap. but it is often uh, quoted and requoted. Yes, a debt trap. Uh, I think uh, it's overstated. It's overstated. Clearly, I mean. I, I see that the, the whole business of China's debt as being a cherry on a cake. Uh, the cake is hollowed out. Yeah. It's decayed, decomposed. It's been rotting for a while. And that's what happened in Sri Lanka. Misgovernance, corruption, mismanagement, all that. And add to that uh, this business of loans. And everybody's looking at the cherry and not the cake. Yeah. So I think uh, lessons drawn uh, from this primarily for all the states, is uh, get your governance right. Governance matters. Get your governance right. Uh, you can learn a lot from Sri Lanka's disaster, a disastrous year. Yep. You can learn a lot from Pakistan. Uh, to some degree, you can learn a lot even from countries like India. Yep. Um, so I would say uh, 
the primary lesson learned is uh, governance. You got to learn from governance. Uh, this business of uh, uh, yeah, make sure I'm sure that countries now in the region, uh, some of them must be affected by this constant debt trap, debt trap. And sure, some of them might want to read the fine print more carefully and the contracts they signed with the Chinese. But uh, don't let that stop you from taking loans is what I would say. But just, just uh, pull up your socks and do yep. your governance better. Okay. Um, let's turn to India. Uh, the India. In India, the political landscape is frequently defined by the delicate balance between majority rule and minority rights. So in light of recent policies and societal changes, how do these dynamics affect India's commitment to democracy, secularism, and its identity of a pluralistic society? I'd like to say zero, yeah. uh, but I don't want to sound extremist. Uh, the point is the record is very poor, especially in the last 10 years, whether it's democracy. I mentioned uh, dismantling institutions of democracy. Uh, every institution you can think of that should be supporting, that you, that you should be strengthening, you're debilitating it, weakening it. Uh, in terms of minority rights, uh, I mean, those who follow what's happening in India know the status of Muslims and increasingly Christians in recent years. Um, so in terms of minority rights, um, let's just say they were not, they're not the same as they were 10 years ago. And uh, the word secularism has acquired a very uh, distasteful uh, tinge as far as India goes, because they think secularists are those uh, who are against uh, the majority and the majority or, or the government itself. So it's a quite a very bad uh, flavor, the word secularism. So the, these uh, um, uh, the change that we have, the changes that we have seen in the last 10 years, uh, people will tell you that, uh, well, that's um, those, are, those are not really important because uh, look what we've got in the last 10 years. We've got a very stable government, number one, and forget the propaganda and the hyperbolic statements that come out. Uh, but interestingly, uh, not just India, if you look at countries like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Nepal, all these leaders have, have been populist, welfareist, uh, primarily they're nationalist. Yes. And guess what? If you go to each of these countries, uh, there's a certain uh, pride in being an Indian or a Sri Lankan, right. all, these, all these leaders have given pride to their citizenship. Now, whether it's hollow or real is irrelevant. The point is everybody, I think it, I, I think it all goes back uh, to the time of MAGA, when MAGA happened, make America great again. Then you heard um, MC Ga, make China great again. Then you heard MR Ga, make Russia great again. Mega, make India great again. Everywhere is going gaga about being great again. Yes. So, in, so just because these countries are just as much as India has become very nationalist. Yes. Uh, and some would say religious nationalism. Uh, it just doesn't mean the other countries in the region have not become nationalist too. There's a, there's a surge of nationalistic fervor and feeling. And, uh, and, and that sense is allowing governments to trample over democratic rights, secularism, minority rights with impunity. Hmm. Sean, we're going to go into a lightning round. Okay. Gonna, we've got, uh, we had uh, some 200 uh, registrants who uh, submitted fantastic questions. Those have been collated and synthesized and kind of going to lightning round. Um, so. Real, uh, real quick responses, but we're gonna. I'll, I'll, so the first one is on U.S. China and regional power dynamics. How is the complex interplay between U.S. and China strategic interest impacting the geopolitical, geopolitical landscape scape and policy responses in South Asia? Now I know you could talk on this for a long time, but how's this affecting it? I'll just say this in the subregion. Uh, in South Asia, uh, I think we would be missing a point if we looked at the whole thing as a U.S.-China competition. Okay, 
uh, it's that's not the way the countries they see. It. They see it as a China India competition. Okay. They don't see it as a China US. Uh, and uh, so you might have countries there who have who would like to have minimal play with India, and they go to China because that's the only option available. Mm -hmm. But that does not make them anti-US. So that's something you want to bear in mind. However, so far. Everybody's been, at least the U.S. or the West, they look at all these countries, India's neighbors, have been looking at those countries through the prism of India's security and strategic interests. And if that continues, uh, then you can find a certain degree of resentment. Because I mentioned to you earlier, there is nationalist fervor yes. across. Everybody wants to be counted for who they are, not because they happen to be in the shadow of a big of another country. country. Very well said. Next one, uh, India's strategic role amidst uh, regional elections. With regional electoral uh, shifts in India's economic trajectory, how might this affect its foreign policy, particularly in terms of alignment with China and responses to regional territorial change, including those posed in Bhutan? Lightning round. I, I didn't get that question. Um, India's strategic role right. amidst the regional uh, elections. We're really asking about uh, how is it having effect uh, on foreign policy uh, and, and the alignment? How is it in, impacting or influencing okay. that? So Bangladesh elections, yeah. uh, which was good news for India because it's a great relationship they have with Mrs. Hasina. Uh, uh, and that's really been time tested in the, the time that she's been there, 15 years. It's grown solid. Uh, or oh, Bhutan is yep. unchanged. Uh, Maldives has changed because it's gone pro. Uh, Pakistan, it's, we have a potential prime minister who's been talking about, okay, we're going to make nice, we're going to be neighborly. Uh, let's wait and watch. Everybody's going to wait and watch to see whether he'll be allowed to be neighborly or not. Uh, Sri Lanka, it's a question mark uh, right now. Oh, Sri Lanka is also navigating the India-China uh, thing, uh, uh, dynamic. Uh, sometimes much to India's annoyance, sometimes to India's satisfaction. So that's a big question mark. Who's going to come there and what that's, what that's going to look like? Uh, who did we leave out? Nepal, yeah. Well, Nepal has had issues with India. Uh, in Nepal, or I, should I put the other way? India has had issues with Nepal uh, of, over, over years. And Nepal right now has a prime minister who is making an effort uh, to be nicer than the previous administration. I mean, in terms of, I say nicer, uh, at least to work uh, closely. One minute response on this next one. Influence of external powers on South Asia's stability. So in what ways have the interventions and <clears throat> policies of external powers, including the United States, influence the political stability and economic development of South Asian countries like Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, etc. I would say it's been positive. However, I must uh, point out that the undercurrent in some countries is decidedly uh, anti-West, anti-US. I'll give you an example. Both Nepal and Sri Lanka uh, were offered the Millennium Corporation Challenge $500 million aid package. Uh, there was a lot of resistance from both the countries, uh, prime, from, the, from the street, prime protests, primarily viewing that as a sellout. Uh, Nepal was able to change that course and signed up. Sri Lanka didn't. Mm. Uh, so I would say uh, when it comes to uh, the U.S.'s uh, role, it's been by and large positive. India and Pakistan will view it slightly differently, as might Bangladesh. Uh, given if it has a long memory, what happened in 1971. But overall, uh, I would say it's positive. We're going to leave that there. Now, as we conclude, Sean, I'd like you to uh, share with us, share with the audience, a book recommendation. Plenty, but I'll stick to one because Thank of you. time. <laughs> There's a book, uh, I think it's very valuable. It's called, it was published last year, uh, written by uh, Dr. Ashoka Modi who's no relative of the prime minister. His, his spelling is M-O-D-Y, not M-O-D-I. Uh, he's a professor at Princeton. 
professor of economics. He's worked at the IMF, worked, worked with World Bank, AT&T AT AT &T and Bells. It's called India is Broken. Mm. Uh, betrayal of people from independence to today. It covers seven and a half decades. Uh, you may not agree with everything he says, but it's very thoughtful, very thought-provoking, uh, and a very good book to uh, understand uh, where India is today, uh, how, it, how and where, how and where, how and why it reached where it is today. I will add it to my reading list. I appreciate that uh, recommendation. So today's deep dive into the power play in South Asia has been just brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Uh, as we think toward the future uh, in two weeks, I'd be excited if you join me on January 29th for a focused discussion titled Taiwan's Post-Election uh, Strategic Future with my esteemed colleague, Professor Mike Burgoyne. And so with that, I'm James Minnick, your host here at Security Nexus webinar. Until we meet again, aloha. Oli. As always, the opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of DKI APCSS, the U.S. Department of Defense, or the U.S. government.